Hey, my name is Lee Catherman, and I would like to share with you my testimony. So I grew up kind of on the streets in the sense that uh, we had a single mom. Sometimes we slept on a friend's floor as a family. Sometimes we camped out. Uh, sometimes we had our own place. But really, times were tough when I was growing up, and there was a lot of times we dumpster dove or did things like that just to just kind of make ends meet. Uh, most of the time we had food, but there were a few times when I remember my younger brother and I, you know, didn't have anything to eat. So we grew up in a tough spot. Everybody around me did drugs. Um, I don't remember any of my mom's friends or anybody else for that matter who didn't do drugs. So growing up, you know, it was inevitable. I was going to become a smoker more than likely. I was going to start doing drugs, drinking, all that stuff. So... In that situation, um, you know, being poor, and it's not an excuse because there's plenty of poor people who don't resort to the things that I resorted to, but I became a criminal and, um, you know, I wouldn't say I was a successful criminal because eventually I went to prison. So in prison, um, I ended up being in a position where you know, they can give you free testing for uh, different diseases like AIDS and hepatitis C and stuff like that. And I said, you know, well, of course, I'll, I'll go through with the testing and see, you know, if I have any of those things. It's possible I've been exposed to them. So they gave me the testing and I came back positive for hepatitis C. Um, at the time, I was 20 something, so I was pretty, pretty healthy still. But I could tell something was wrong with me anyway, and I ended up getting retested because I, you know, I wanted to make sure. But when they tested me, um, you know, once I found out I had hepatitis C, um, I really started to notice it take effect in my life. I mean, you know, your skin kind of gets a pasty yellowish color, and that kind of happens with prison too. But your eyes start to get yellowing around the outer edges of your eyes, and you start to feel really lethargic, and you know it becomes really tough to, you know, do everything. And uh, once I found out I had hepatitis C, I didn't want to tell anybody. But I I started, you know, to, to try and dig deeper. Once you find out you're going to die, you start to wonder, like, is there more to life? Am I missing something? Do I need to, do I need to figure something out? And I've always felt like uh, there was something more, something greater. And I started to read... Um, I read the Quran, I read uh, some Eastern religion books and some mythology type of books. And, you know, it wasn't until I read the Bible more in depth that I realized there's something about it that you just can't deny. It speaks to your heart. And so I continued to uh, read the Bible and... I still had never told anybody that I had hepatitis C and I probably never would have told anybody that because it was something that I was afraid of people knowing and ashamed. And uh, it was something that, you know, I didn't want, nobody was coming to visit me. I mean, literally my own mom never came to see me. Um, you know, I was probably going to die in prison. That's kind of how I felt about it. And really just, you know, I had believed in God before that, I would say, but I was never real about believing in God. So, you know, you have to put trust in something to really show faith. And I had never trusted in God completely. I'd never served him. I just would acknowledge him, but never served. And so um, I felt like something was calling me. I started going to church and, you know, meeting with a group of guys who were really doing it right. So it was just, uh, it was a couple of Russian, uh, Russian guys were coming into the, the prison system and, and doing a church service. And uh, I just really felt like they were on point with what the Bible says. And the more that I uh, went to church and read the Bible, the more it, it just started to well up in me that you know, God is real. Anyway, a long story into this. While I was in one of the church services, I was sitting there and a guy behind me stood up 
They would they would call for prayer if anybody wanted to in the beginning of the service. Hey, does anyone want to pray? And a guy stood up behind me and he just started bawling. And that's something you don't do in prison. That show of weakness would get you preyed upon and it's not a good idea. So this guy just started bawling. I mean, just letting it all out, just sobbing, bawling. He was missing his wife and his kids and he had a feeling that they were likely not to be coming to see him anymore. And you could just tell that his whole world was destroyed because who he was as an identity was a father and a husband and that made his life and he without it he felt like he was nothing i literally thought that the guy might kill himself just this is how bad it was for him so they all started praying for him but it wasn't until that moment that they that he had got up and cried like that that i realized that my whole life you know i'd grown up around people who um, weren't good examples of what you know a person should be so I never trusted women I never could trust them I was a womanizer I would date women and you know maybe they'd fall in love with me or whatever but I wouldn't let myself fall in love with them and I just basically you know I was just looking to sleep with every girl that would let me and I feel like that uh, thing about me was something that, you know, was just, you know, from being abused as a child or whatever, it didn't really matter. The idea was, I didn't want to be that way. There was something about me that wanted to be a husband, that wanted to be loyal, to be trusted, to be trustworthy, I wanted to be a man of integrity, but I just never could do it. And I also wanted to be a dad, but I would never have been a good father. I would have always, you know, probably ditched out on the kids or something, something terrible like that. And, you know, not intentionally, so to speak, but just out of the fact that I was a loser and there was no way I was going to be able to provide for any kids. But anyway, as they were praying for him, and this is a really cool thing too, as another testimony for him, is almost all the members of the church got up and put their hands on him and prayed for him and literally a few weeks later him and his wife reconciled and she started coming back everything went back to normal for him and and that's just an awesome testimony for prayer there but as they were praying for him i finally had my heart broken to the point where i can't rely on myself anymore god i need you I got down on my hands and my knees and put my face against the ground. And I knew if I continued with this disease, there's no way I could be a husband. There's no way I could be a father. There's no way I could be a man of integrity if I was just going to die and let people down. So I just started praying. I just said, God, if it's in your will, I believe you died for my sins. Lord Jesus, please take this disease from me. And I just prayed. And as I was praying, it was like my voice didn't come out normal because I was speaking normally. There was It was noisy in the room. Nobody could even hear me. I was down on the ground. But I, as I was speaking, it's like my voice came out like, like, and just started sounding different to me. And as I was praying, this, that simple prayer that I meant from the innermost parts of my heart, it was as if two fists shoved into both sides of my guts. And I picture like gauntlets covered in razor blades, tearing and ripping at the flesh inside my body from, from my neck to the, the top, the, you know, top of my waist, my entire torso. It felt as if it was being shredded to bits inside. It was some of the most painful feelings I've ever had inside my body. And I just crippled over in pain and I couldn't stop saying, God, please don't kill me, because I just felt like I was going to die. I just kept saying, God, please don't kill me. God, please don't kill me. And I just kept saying it over and over and over again. God, please don't kill me. And I could barely move, but I got up and I just, I didn't even say goodbye to anybody. I got out of there and I went back to my bunk and I laid on my bunk and I just kept saying, God, please don't kill me. God, please don't kill me. And that pain wouldn't stop. It was so vicious inside me. It was just like unrelenting. And I was so scared, I thought I was gonna die. And I just kept praying, God, please don't kill me. Somehow I fell asleep and I don't even know how, but I woke up the next day and nothing was wrong with me. You know, I was back, you know, nothing, everything felt the same as normal. 
end a few weeks later, and I don't know how long, because I literally forgot about that night, because I said to myself, Lee, you're just, you're so silly, you thought you were going to die, but literally there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with you, you just had some kind of crazy, super painful muscle spasms, where you were just, you're all worked up about nothing. A few weeks later was my next six month exam, and I was only in prison for five years, so when that next six month exam happened, my uh, my test results, instead of sending me a kite, they called me in and I was so worried because when I went in, I just had butterflies in my stomach. I felt like, you know, they're, they're just gonna tell me the worst news. Otherwise, why would they call me in? But when the doctor called me in, he was an older doctor, probably in his 70s. And he said he'd been, you know, treating this disease for a long time. They have no cure, but um, guys my age, because I was in my mid-20s, he said, get the disease, and they go from, um, they their immune system fights the disease off into a place of remission, and they basically just carry it around because they're relatively healthy. But as they get older, the disease rears its ugly head, and their immune system starts to fade, and the disease kills them. And he goes, I, he thought that I had had it for a long time because my levels were so high. But he said they needed to retest me. And they said something really strange had happened when they checked my results. He said, it's as if the disease was never in your body. There's no sign of it. We, we can't find anything. There's nothing wrong with your liver. My, heart, my blood pressure, everything was back to normal. And you know, it was really strange and something I didn't even notice at the time. Because every day I'm brushing my teeth, looking in the mirror, my eyes went back to being white. My skin went back to being a normal flesh tone, not a yellow, offish, weird, pasty color. And so I had been getting better, but I didn't even realize it. And they said, it's as if you never had the disease. There is no sign of it in your body. And I was just floored because I couldn't believe it. And then he said, they wanted to have my permission to take my findings and put them in a medical journal. And I agreed, but I was like, you know, they just asked me a barrage of questions. You know, what, did you change anything about your eating? Change anything about your diet? Did you, anything at all? Did you change your amount of sleeping? You, you're using different products? Are you working out more, working out less, not working out? What, it, they asked me every question that they possibly could. And there wasn't anything different about my lifestyle. I'm in prison. There's nothing I can do different. So anyway, at the very end of his conversation with me, he said, it's like a miracle. And when he said that, it was like that key word that sent me to a different place. But without really thinking about it, I went back in my mind, like back to that day, and I could just see myself prostrate on the floor, praying to God and pouring out my my everything to him and just asking him for help. And I never heard God's voice. I never saw an angel or anything like that. But I could feel as if God was speaking to me saying, I heard what you had to say. I know you meant what you said. And I'm going to give you everything that you are desiring in your heart. So I feel like what I desired in my heart was real. And I felt like God sees that and knew that it was something he wanted for me. I think he gives me those, and you, the desires of this heart that we have that he gives us, not a heart of stone that we have on our own, but this heart of flesh. Anyway, I was healed, and I've been healed since that day, and there was even a part of me that didn't believe it, and I got retested again, and I'm perfectly healthy. There's no sign of disease in my body. It's as if I never had it. And it's just one of those amazing things that happened in my life that have made it to where I can never doubt him. And now God has given me a family. God has given me a home business. God has given me, he's made me a rich man. And I have everything I could ever desire and more. And it's just like it says, you know, in the Bible that what he wants for us is greater than we can even imagine. No one's even had thought of it. It's never come into their mind. They've never heard it. It's greater than that. And that's the kind of things he wants for us. And that's the kind of thing he's delivered to me. And that 
is my testimony. And I'm glad I got a chance to tell you all about it. Bless you in Jesus' name.